on our social media channels and I'm going to hit start webinar and wait for a few seconds to let participants uh, join in. Okay, and people are starting to filter in. Great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with you all uh, again. Uh, 11th Annual Transforming Trauma Conference hosted by The Gatehouse in partnership with various community partners. We are live streaming on all our social media channels. Um, and we are here today with Kelsey LaRue, and she's going to be talking to us about reflecting on sexual violence and anti-Black racism. Uh, Kelsey is the program coordinator at the Black Peer Education Network at Black Women in Motion. Kelsey is a child and youth care practitioner who's been working with different agencies, including the Gatehouse, for a few years to create strategies for transformative social change and community awareness about childhood sexual abuse. She believes that being an advocate for change means being a support, a guide, taking care of yourself and others. It means making difficult decisions about pushing forward for change in social policy and legislation. In her role as program facilitator for the Black Peer Education Network, she encourages critical, honest, and reflective conversations about sexual violence and consent within the Black community. It is my utmost honor to introduce Kelsey LaRue and uh, take it on from here. Kelsey, welcome everyone in the room as well. Thank you, Maria, and thank you everyone else for being here, taking the time to listen and engage with this sort of content. Um, I'll be presenting for about an hour, and some of the stuff that I will be talking about could be potentially triggering, especially if you are a Black survivor. <laughs> um, today's presentation is sort of like a crash course into the Black Peer Education Network program, um, and I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about that in a moment. But first, I want to start off by opening the space with a land acknowledgement. So I acknowledge the sacred land on which I work, known as Toronto, and traditionally as Turtle Island, is the sacred land and ancestral territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Métis, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Toronto is governed by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes and its resources. It is also covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the New Credit. I recognize the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who've spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. As settlers, it is paramount that we do our part to address the ongoing health inequities, systemic injustice, and violence faced by indigenous peoples and communities. Our part includes becoming educated on the long and extensive history of genocide and erasure that indigenous folks continue to face today. Doing our part also includes participating in land back efforts and raising awareness about issues at hand. So I'm going to be dropping a few resources in the chat in just a second. And these are all tools that you can use at your own discretion um, for your own learning. The first three links are um, sort of interactive mapping websites. So nativeland.ca, and whose land and code for Anchorage sort of leverage one another. Um, they're created so that settlers, non-Indigenous people know about the land that we are situated on, the language, the treaties and agreements that exist. <coughs> uh, you can use any of these resources to identify where you are in the country, be it within Toronto or outside of the GTA, anywhere in Canada and find out whose land you're on, what are the treaties that reside there and the languages that were spoken. So as Maria said, I have uh, quite the history with the Gatehouse. I started as a placement student. Uh, you may have seen me in the office doing some administrative stuff. I may have scheduled or facilitated your intakes, maybe done some one-on-ones. I helped facilitate the phase one women's program twice already. Um, as you can see from the pictures, I was present at the eighth annual Transforming Trauma Conference in 2018. And I presented this game called Connections, uh, which sort of um, identifies different community resources and the supports they have to support with different situations based on gender-based violence and sexual violence. I also created a video which was showcased at the Center for Transformative Social Change Conference, I think also in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, Maria. Um, and that was a visual narrative about the healing process um, 
and sort of what that looks like. And then I started a fundraiser campaign with Indigo and these might've been some of the images that you've seen. I have a group agreement that I wanna go through quickly. I know folks don't have access to speak, uh, but you are still able to utilize the chat and I'm hoping that folks are able to engage with the content. So this is sort of the rules that I have when engaging. Uh, please limit your own distractions, make adjustments that will allow you to be fully present, present. So either turn off your phone or put it on do not disturb, um, have headphones in, I have my AirPods in, but also nobody else is home. Um, no attacks. This is a self first space. So please, if you need to get up, get a drink of water, grab something to eat, grab a squishy. I usually have like a stress ball, long gone. <laughs> my <laughs> nephew stole it from me. Um, please keep all information confidential. Don't share anything in the space um, that is too classified um, or personal. And we're not sharing anything outside of the space. Practice consent and respect each other's boundaries. Do not share and discuss things without consent and do not give unsolicited advice before checking in. Remain accountable to yourself and I will remain accountable to you. Um, if I don't have an answer for you, I'd be more than happy to connect with uh, Maria about any other questions and I can get back to folks. Um, practice empathetic listening. So listen to understand rather than to respond, ask questions. Uh, affirm experience, show compassion, be reflective, uh, follow up and check in, honor each other's stories, and oh, I have <laughs> practice. Uh, this is a practice space twice. So this is a practice space. Um, use I statements and recognize that some of the information that I'm going to talk about today might not be reflective of you as an individual, as I am speaking directly to the Black experience. Uh, but please take time to sit and reflect on how your own experiences either may be similar or different. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about intersectionality and what that looks like. And then finally, sit in the discomfort. If you are having feelings of guilt or shame about some of the things that we talk about, especially as we talk about microaggressions, um, we're gonna sit with that discomfort and reflect on why it's there and how we can work to do better. Black Women in Motion is a Toronto-based grassroots organization that empowers and supports the advancement of Black women, so trans, cis, femme, non-binary, and gender non-conforming survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for the Black Peer Education Network, but we have four key programs. Um, the Black Youth Employment Assistance Program, which is a 12-week virtual employment and entrepreneurial focused program for Black women, trans, cis, femmes, non-binary, and gender non-conforming survivors of gender-based violence. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, the Love Offering Community Emergency Relief Fund, which is for Black women, trans, cis, femmes, non-binary, and gender non-conforming folks experiencing food and income insecurity as a result of COVID-19. Currently, we're not taking any more applications as we are supporting approximately 500 people right now. Our Crystals and Sage Wellness Initiative, it's a 12-week yoga and mindfulness program for trans, uh, for Black trans, genderqueer, and non-binary survivors of gender-based violence. And this program will be starting in 2022. And then my program, Black Peer Education Network. So the BPEN program is a six-month employment and training program for Black women, trans, cis, femmes, genderqueer, and non-binary survivors between the ages of 16 to 29. The program provides learning spaces for survivors to collectively work through dismantling and challenging rape culture within the Black community by encouraging critical conversations about gender-based violence, anti-Blackness, patriarchy, queerphobia, white supremacy, colonization, and consent. Our goal is for the program participants to leave more educated on what rape culture is and how to recognize and challenge situations and environments that normalize and perpetuate this way of thinking. We wanna challenge rape culture at home, in our schools, on campus, in our social circles, on social media, in our community and beyond. Consent animators are working in collaboration with WIM staff and partner organizations to coordinate events like our annual consent campaign and weekend of action against rape culture conference, which I will talk more about at the very end of this presentation. Um, 
And the purpose of these events is to increase critical dialogue on rape culture and the role each of us play in fighting and pushing back. Today, we're going to be talking about um, anti-Black racism, gender-based violence and intersectionality and sort of how they intersect with one another. And then I'm gonna bring us into rape culture and media literacy and talk about how the narratives have been framed and are now implemented to set the expectation of um, how to police and monitor black bodies, black and indigenous bodies. And then finally talking about how to better support black survivors. So by the end of today's presentation, you'll be able to identify concrete examples of anti-black racism and sexual violence, as well as identify strategies to support black survivors and deconstruct systems of oppression on an individual and cultural level. Okay, so anti-Black racism, what is it and what does it look like? Please feel free to throw anything that you can think of in the chat. If you see questions up on the screen, I'm looking for answers. That's why the question's there. Um, racism is defined as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. So in this case, Anti-Black racism is racism against Black people. There are four main types of racism. Uh, the first one being interpersonal racism. So prejudices and discriminatory behaviors where one group makes an assumption about the abilities, motives, and intents of other groups based on race. So an example of this would be people crossing the street when they see a Black man walking towards them on the street. Or phrases like, you're pretty for a dark skin, or you're so articulate. These are not only examples of interpersonal racism, but also microaggressions, which I'm gonna talk about in our next slide. Internalized racism is when members of a stigmatized and oppressed group are bombarded with negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth, that they may internalize those negative messages. So an example of this could be black men hating or choosing not to date black women, uh, colorism within any industry or futurism that focuses on beauty standards that are Eurocentric. Uh, institutionalized racism is when organization, sorry, organizations, businesses, or institutions such as schools, police departments, uh, healthcare discriminate against uh, either deliberately or indirectly against certain groups of people to limit their rights. Uh, an example of this is overrepresentation of black indigenous and people of color within the criminal justice system. And finally, systemic racism. So system-wide discrimination and prejudice based on race. Black Canadians having a 12.5% unemployment rate compared to a 5.7% unemployment rate for other visible minorities is an example of systemic racism. All forms of racism are informed by biases. So there's two forms of biases, explicit bias and implicit bias. Explicit bias is conscious and deliberate held beliefs and attitudes about a person or group. Overt negative attitudes and behavior expressed through verbal and physical harassment and violence. So explicit bias is evident in what we say and what we do. For example, any form of like racism, hate speech, colorism, and other forms of discrimination. Implicit bias, on the other hand, also known as unconscious bias, are thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs that you may not be aware of, but influence your judgment. It is an unconscious, indirect attribution um, of particular qualities to a member of a certain social group. So while these may be unintentional, they're still harmful. And these can also look like mic microaggressions. So microaggressions are everyday, unconscious and conscious slights, insights, sorry, slights, insults, indignities, and negative messages sent to oppressed identities by well-intentioned privileged identities who are unaware of the hidden messages being communicated. Whether intentional or unintentional, they communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target people based solely on their marginalized group membership. So there's three types of microaggressions, micro assaults, micro insults, and micro invalidations. Micro assaults, so avert, intentional, subtle slights and insults, so, such as following a person around the store because you suspect they're shoplifting, shouting racial slurs at someone while passing them on the street, 
or attempting to grope a trans person to check if they belong in the public restroom that they are using. These are all like assaults because you have not only identified that there is a racial explicit bias happening, but you are going out of your way to intentionally uh, cause harm with that individual. Micro insults are verbal and nonverbal communications that subtly convey rudeness and insensitivity and demean a person's racial heritage or identity. So, wow, you speak articulate for a black person. I, if I had literally a nickel for every time I had this, I would actually be a millionaire. Um, it's slights like this that seem like a compliment, like, wow, you're so articulate, but also says, I didn't expect you to know, first of all, to have a certain level of communication, uh, whether it be academic or professional, whatever the case may be, simply on the basis that I am black, but also that I am able to communicate effectively and politely is another micro insult that is tied into that because as a black woman, I am framed as aggressive or unprofessional and all of these other derogatory names. So when we think about how we address folks and like the context that we're giving these compliments, what are we really saying? And then finally, there's micro invalidations. Communication that subtly excludes, negates or nullifies the thoughts, feelings or experiential reality of a person of color, which aims to make that person feel invisible. It was just a joke. I'm sure that's not what they meant to say, why are you taking it so personally? Well, maybe you shouldn't have made it personal to begin with. <laughs> All forms of microaggressions invalidate Black folks from being understood as victims, as well as being understood as being able to relay their story accurately. So there is an inherent criminality, hypersexualization, and aggressiveness that uh, anybody within a Black body is automatically assumed to possess and it doesn't matter what area they lived in, uh, who their parents are, who they know, from face value, this is the automatic narrative. But when we remove uh, the microaggressions, check in with our internal and external biases, check in with our privilege, um, and take a step back, listen to what's being heard, we're going to go back to that empathetic listening and say, wow, that experience sounds terrible. I am so sorry for X, Y, and Z. How can I support you? Or this isn't something that I've experienced. I've never had the barrier of having to be afraid of going to the police or of going to a doctor and knowing I'm going to be dismissed simply for the color of my skin. Um, so when we check ourselves and say, I don't have that experience, so I can't speak to this, you take a moment to sit back and listen and be like, Thank you for sharing. Now I wanna talk about intersectionality and gender-based violence and sort of where the two sort of cross paths. So gender-based violence, I'm sure all of us know, is a form of power-based violence that involves the use and abuse of power and control over another person and is perpetuated against someone based on their gender identity, gender expression, or perceived gender. So, Intersectionality was coined by Dr. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in 1989 in a paper that was written. And it's used to understood, understand how our multiple aspects of our identities shape our experiences and how we are seen. It also is used to understand how uh, oppression impacts an individual's experience. While we know gender-based violence is an overall issue, we need to pay attention to intersectionality in order to understand who is most impacted. Intersectionality looks at race, gender identity, gender presentation, class, ability, neighborhood, education, mental health, size, et cetera, and allows us as service providers and as individuals to understand the experiences people may have based on their particular intersections. Someone who is cis, het, white, and female would have very little resistance accessing medical support as a survivor. Change any of these factors and that person's experience could look incredibly different. So these are just some statistics and I wanted to look at them through an intersectional lens to highlight why intersectionality is important when we're looking into um, statistics, when we're looking into research and how to better support survivors. 
um, the statistics of who is impacted the most, those should be the people that are leading the way on the solution. So what do we need in order to heal? What do we need in order to have better access to supports? What are the barriers that you are facing? So half of all women in Canada have experienced at least one incident of physical or sexual violence since the age of 16. More than 60% of women with disabilities will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks are 12 times more likely to be murdered or missing than any other woman in Canada, and 16 times more likely than white women. Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks make up about 11.3% of total number of missing women in Canada, but only make up 4.3% of the total population. So just looking at these statistics, we can see that there is very clear targets within gender-based violence. Like gender-based violence is incredibly broad, uh, but there's particular groups of people who are more at risk than others and who need additional resources. And when we're thinking about um, supports, we need to think about equity rather than equality. So in equity, who needs what types of support? And where do we sort of, how do we mitigate some of those risks? Whereas other communities might not need some of those supports. And then here's some statistics that are on race-based violence statistics. Um, so 43% of hate crimes in 2017 were motivated by hatred of a race or ethnicity. 30, there's been a 37% increase in Canada of police reported hate crimes during the first year of the pandemic. 16% of hate crimes in 2017 were specifically against Black populations. More than 1,000 attacks against Asian Canadians have been reported one year into the global COVID-19 pandemic. One out of three trans women are murdered. Immigrant women are more vulnerable to domestic violence due to economic dependence, language barriers, and a lack of knowledge about community resources. With funding from YWCA Canada, BWIM is working to identify how gender-based violence affects Black folks in Canada on an institutional, individual, and community level. Uh, the data analyzed within the survey will be used as a way to further understand what changes are needed to support Black survivors. What became alarming was the number of Black-identified folks who experienced some form of sexual violence by the age of 20. So we had 102 people respond to the first round of our survey. Uh, 101 folks identified as Black and 88 out of that 101, so 86% of people who responded um, had experienced some form of sexual violence by the age of 20. So that is more than the one in three that Stats Canada predicts and more than the one in two that we realistically predict as we know that many, um, many incidents of sexual violence go unreported. When it comes to issues that affect Black women, finding numbers is even more difficult. Numbers from the United States consistently show us that Black women experience extremely high rates of domestic violence and that domestic violence is a leading cause of death for Black women. Statistics on rates of death uh, sorry, statistics on rates of violence against Black women are not available in Canada. Canada also does not keep statistics on the rates of murder, violence, poverty, or homelessness faced by trans Canadians. Again, we know from the United States that Black trans women are killed at staggering rates, yet as Canadians, we seem to simply believe that we don't have the same problem. Without an, without an explicit framework that identifies that Black women have always been disproportionately impacted by every issue we discuss, and without prioritizing gendered violence, we, Black women, will always be left as an afterthought. Black women and queer folks consistently do the work to advocate, raise awareness, and begin dismantling systems of oppression, and then are consistently told to take a seat. Don't jeopardize the process by asking for things right now. Don't undermine Black men in public. Don't speak about our assaults in case it makes the community look bad. Don't divide or distract the feminist movement by demanding that race be addressed and to just be patient, be happy with things as they are and be last in line after everyone else has benefited from our labor. For years, Toronto Burke was in the trenches working directly with survivors of sexual harassment. She listened to the story of a young woman burdened with the memory of her assault and dedicated her life to making sure that black 
and disenfranchised women were a part of the conversation. Me Too started as a response to anti-Black and racial discrimination, as well as sexual harassment and violence. The current movement has all but erased the former. It is without surprise that it was white affluent women who were believed and brought more media attention to this movement. I have this quote from Gabrielle Union. I think the floodgates have opened for white women. I don't think it's coincidence whose pain has been taken seriously, whose pain we have showed historically and continued to show, whose pain is tolerable and whose pain is intolerable and whose pain needs to be addressed now. And this quote isn't to other anybody. It's not to say that um, black women's pain or white women's pain is worse than the other, but rather to understand that we are all experiencing pain, but white women have been given the privilege of being allowed to own their victimization. Whereas black women are continuously silenced, shamed, and are not given the space or time to heal, work through and process, grieve, and then jump back into life. Um, many of us experience re-victimization, increasing trauma, more racial hate um, as we address sexual violence within the community. Um, and it's really hard to navigate, especially when it comes from within, which is why the work that I'm doing with WIM, I think is so important. And I really love to be able to create these uh, healing spaces. I have groups of like eight to 12 women for about six months, um, depending on the program that I'm running. And all of them have such different lived experiences and all of them are so incredibly thankful to be able to be in the space, to learn and see themselves as victims and as people who have overcome pain, um, to be in a space where they don't have to be stronger, they don't have to be um, resilient, they can be soft, they can be gentle, they can be vulnerable, they can cry, um, they can talk about anger and feel safe and validated with other Black women who also share many of those lived experiences. So now I'm gonna talk about rape culture and media literacy. Um, so this, the next few slides, there's about three slides and then a video uh, could potentially be triggering. There's going to be three images, one per slide. Um, they're all drawings, but could be seen as sexual, lewd, uh, and potentially triggering. So please, if you need to take space, if you need to step away for a second or just look away and just listen, do whatever you need to to care for yourself. So first I'm gonna start with the fetishite, I can never say it, fetishization, you know what I mean, and sexualization of black and, black and indigenous bodies. And I would love for everybody in this space to answer the reflection question here. So how and where do you see the sexualization and fetishization of Black and Indigenous bodies in media today? And how have they been colonized? So, and I will be keeping an eye on the chat as I'm also talking about Sarah Bartman, who is pictured here. So a fetish, a fetish is a sexual fixation on a specific object or act that is absolutely necessary to a person's sexual gratification. When a group or kind of person becomes the object of a fetish, it usually means that they are understood as outliers, so non-human, exotic, deviant. And so the desire someone feels towards this group of, towards this group as a fetish is attraction to the perception about the group rather than that unique individual. Uh, I lost my in my notes. Being considered a fetish means being considered taboo. You're not seen as a full person, which means a person's components can then be fetishized as well. And I'm seeing in the chat, music videos, clothing advertisements, absolutely. Um, I'm looking specifically even to like body parts and types, like how does that manifest? I know one example, like the Kardashians for one, the lip injections, the Brazilian butt lifts, um, all the lip fillers, these are all um, examples of black features that have been 
first of all, we were sexualized and then demonized and told it's inappropriate to have these as like body parts put in freak shows, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then these features have then been taken by many white people and appropriated. So the benefit for white folks is clout on social media or like a beauty standard. But if black women and black uh, identified folks have these particular features that are natural, they're often made fun of, bullied, um, persecuted, like hair textures, the braids, oh my goodness, the number of times people just come up to me and touch my hair. I can't wait to do that to my hair. Mm, this is part of the fetishization and sexualization of black bodies. Like this is just like a piece that you can take for yourself, but that I would be made fun of, which I have been made fun of actually recently, not a story for right now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, big lips, black hair. Absolutely. Just looking in the chat. So I don't know if everybody in the space knows who's pictured here, but her, this isn't her actual picture. This is just a characterization. Um, but this is Sarah Bartman. She is an example of how black bodies and features are exaggerated and distorted for the entertainment of colonizers. She was not a slave, but was taken to uh, Cape Town. Sorry, not taken to Cape Town. Uh, she was exhibited within Bartman Hall. At Dunlop exhibited Bartman in Egyptian Hall of Piccadilly Circus on the 24th of November in 1810. And Dunlop is the person who brought her over and um, thought he could make money off of Londoners' lack of familiarity with Africans because Bartman's bottom was differently shaped. People came to see her because they saw her not as a person, but as a pure example of this one part of the natural world. So she was put on like this freak show tour it was her and one other person and I think a boy um, and their bodies were exhibited because of how different they were laughed at people threw food all of that um, so this is just like the starting example of how we're going to take like body parts and use that to shame people and then this is a postcard from 1949 I don't know if it's difficult for other folks to see, but the text on the top reads, honey, I'm waiting for you way down south. So if folks can put in the chat, what is the subtext of this postcard and what purpose does the subtext serve? And I have no problem waiting for some answers. But black female ch children are sexually objectified Black girls with the faces of pre-teenagers are drawn with adult size bottoms, uh, which are exposed. Usually they're painted either naked, scantily clad, or hiding seductively behind towels, blankets, trees, or other objects. Um, if you go on vacation, you'll often see like ashtrays and like other souvenirs that have black bodied individuals with exaggerated features. That's sort of the sexualization. Uh, this 1949 postcard shows a naked black girl hiding her genitals with a paper fan. Although she has the appearance of a small child, she has noticeable breasts. The accompanying cap caption reads, honey, I was waiting for you down south. And the sexual innuendo is obvious. Um, the drawing itself, you can see the clear black face with the big red lips. Um, and that's indicative of the minstrel shows, which we all know and hate. Um, I'm seeing children being sexualized and sexually enticing to adults. Absolutely. So the video that I'm going to show is going to talk a little bit about this, but from the very first point of contact in the 16th century, um, Black women and Indigenous women were hypersexualized because of the nature of their dressing. So they thought because breasts were out on display that they were hypersexual. Um, and that also meant that they were unrapeable. This is something that translates more into uh, more mainstream 
media um, towards the end of slavery into that reconstruction period, um, which I will also talk about in a minute. But yeah, the sexualization of children is something that is still within mainstream media. This postcard is from literally the year after. So what is some of the subtext that you can see? How does this differ from the first picture? And how is it the same? So I is not, it must be something I ate. So this postcard shows a black girl approximately eight years old standing in a watermelon patch. She has a protruding stomach um, and her exposed right shoulder and the churlish grin suggests that the protruding stomach resulted from a sexual experience, not overeating. The portrayal of this prepubescent girl as pregnant suggests that black females are sexually active and sexually irresponsible, even as small children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the belief that black women are sexually promiscuous is propagated by innumerable images of pregnant black women and black women with large numbers of children. Um, so this is sort of the beginning. And then we're gonna talk about see, some, who English is bleeding today. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about some of the tropes that came out of um, some of these ideas. Uh, so after the Civil War, there was an overwhelming need to separate from British history, as well as control how society viewed Black people. Hence, minstrel shows were created in 1828. So Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who was a struggling white actor, became famous by performing in blackface makeup as Jim Crow. Uh, an exaggerated, highly stereotypical black character. There are several tropes that are consistently depicted throughout the media that start out as menstrual characters and now exist as the mold for black folks. The brute man jingo trope begins in the time period between the end of slavery and the beginning of Jim Crow segregation, which is now known as reconstruction period, so 1863 to 1877, which implies that black men without the guiding hand of slavery are unable to overcome their animal impulses and are rapists, murderers, beasts. And you can see this very clearly in, um, oh, what's that movie called? It's fleeting my brain now. I'll come back to it. Um, but the idea that black men are unable to control their impulses without the guiding hand of slavery, why do you think that trope is created and what pur purpose do you think that it serves? <laughs> And as you think about that, stereotypes like Blacks like watermelon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you think about that, I want you all to remember that uh, many white people have never met a Black person before and that movies and comedy shows that were widely popular became the only context that people understood Blackness as their point of reference. So the Mandingo trope did such a good job of shaping public perception of black men that it is responsible for the public perception that happened in the Central Park Five case in 1989. And if you wanna learn more about that, you can watch When They See Us on Netflix, um, which really highlighted that white people have this idea of who and what black men are and was a classic case of what rape would look like. Um. Just looking back in the chat. Makes white population feel entitled to help control the black people around them. Socially acceptable. Absolutely, yes. So black men who were previously slaves would have been working their whole lives and they would have been bigger and stronger compared to the respectfully dressed and sized white man. Um, consider from the white man's perspective how scary these big black men were rightfully angry might seem as they are no longer controlled as slaves um, and sort of brought into everyday life. So like that was scary. So they needed to form a narrative that would control how everybody sees black bodies and keep a sort of status quo. Mm -hmm. 
And then the portrayal of black women as Jezebel's, uh, Jezebel started first and then the Mammy and Sapphire, which the video will talk about. Um, but the portrayal of black women as Jezebel's and the descriptive words associated with this stereotype are singular in their focus. Seductive, alluring, worldly, beguiling, tempting, and lewd. Excuse me. Historically, white women as a category were portrayed as models of self-respect, self-control, and modesty, even, excuse me, sexual purity. But black women were often portrayed as innately promiscuous, even predatory. It is a mistake to assume that only or even mainly fair complexion black women were sexually objectified by the larger American society. For the early 1630s to the present, black American women of all shades have been portrayed as hypersexual bad black girls. Let's talk about how black women are portrayed in pop culture. Cut, great, but let's get it sassier. Really? Perfect. From the sassy black friend, to the sexy prostitute on the wrong side of the tracks, to the overly helpful house cleaner, black women are so very often stereotyped in pop culture. But these stereotypes are more than lazy writing, they have long histories. So maybe we should just get fucking rid of them. Meet the Jezebel. She's sexual, she's aggressive, she just wants it all the time. You know what I mean. And considering we live in such a hypersexual world, the Jezebel must be a new thing, right? Not even close. When Europeans first traveled to Africa in the 17th century, they were shocked that African dress exposed so much skin, totally ignoring the fact that it's way hotter in Africa than in Europe. <gasps> Why don't you have 17 skirts on? The horny European explorers then assumed African women were sexually lewd animals trying to seduce them. And thus, the Jezebel stereotype was born. And in 19th century America, the long running stereotype of African women with large sexual appetites was often used by slave owners to justify rape. In fact, it was argued that it wasn't possible to rape a black woman because of that fabled sexual appetite. Cut to the Jim Crow South and everyday items like ashtrays, postcards and drinking glasses depicted over-sexualized images of black women and girls, reinforcing this dangerous stereotype. And it was dangerous. During that time, black women were regularly assaulted by white men and they rarely faced criminal charges. And while this stereotype has persisted throughout TV and film history, today you can usually find the Jezebel archetype in music videos and all over reality TV. It also pops up in the policing of black women's bodies and sexuality. Just ask Rihanna or Nikki or Beyonce. But remember, too much sexuality can be threatening. So meet the Mammy. Mammy's fat, old and very dark skin. She was given these physical traits to show that she was undesirable and prove that white slave owners didn't find black women attractive. The Mammy lived on through Jim Crow to imply that black women were only fit to be domestic workers. We began to see the Mammy characters everywhere, from books and movies to advertising, like Aunt Jemima. And if you think this stereotype doesn't still have power in media, the first black woman to win an Academy Award for acting was Hattie McDaniel, playing a slave era Mammy in Gone with the Wind. 70 plus years later, the incredibly talented Octavia Spencer won an Oscar for playing a 1950s style Mammy in The Help. So Black women are either seductresses or non-sexual happy workers. So what else is there? Meet the headstrong black woman. She's loud, she's sassy, and she doesn't take anybody's shit. Let's skip straight to the root of this pop culture stereotype. Amos and Andy. In the 1930s, this popular radio show took the world by storm. While the two main characters were supposed to be black, they were actually voiced by white men. And the entire appeal of the show was the mockery of black behavior and dialect. As if that wasn't offensive enough, the duo were joined by Kingfish, their con artist friend, and his domineering, aggressive, and emasculating, nagging wife, Sapphire the prototypical headstrong black woman. Amos and Andy later became a TV show, which was eventually protested by the NAACP, but the damage was already done. The show popularized racial caricatures of black people. Here Americans learned that black people were comical, not as actors, but as a race. Following the success of Amos and Andy, sitcoms in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s copied this portrayal of black women and wives. From the Jeffersons to Martin, black women were often shown as naggy and always having a sassy comeback to any challenge. Fast forward to the 90s, the headstrong black woman becomes 
the sassy black friend, with characters like Dion and Clueless, or Nurse Laverne Roberts and Scrubs, and basically every reality show about black women. Spoiler alert, reality TV isn't reality. Popular media often relegates black women to the one-dimensional sidekick with lots of sass and endless one-liners, but little personality. As much as we try to deny it, media plays a major part in how we view the world around us and promotes a general sense of self. When 70% of black women say that they fear their coworkers perceiving them as the sassy black woman and then attempt to change their personalities to fit in, don't you think it's time to retire this stereotype? Sexy, shy, sassy, demure, black women come with all sorts of personalities. So it's time for media to wise up and show us in all of our complexity, instead of the one note stereotypes we've seen over the years. So what other racial stereotypes are you tired of seeing on TV? And have people ever assumed that you're like any of those? Tell us in the comments below and we will see you. All right. That was a lot of information, a lot of uh, tropes. I'm sure you can probably see any and all of these tropes within any form of media that you see with any Black person. Um, these tropes sort of define how we respond to Black people, uh, especially Black survivors. Oftentimes, um, when we are more upfront and confident and say, this happened, um, it can seem aggressive um, and pushy, domineering, and then we'll oftentimes get dismissed because of the believability that, or sorry, get dismissed because of the belief that Black women are unrapeable or they're too aggressive and too upfront to be victims of gender-based violence. They're either capable of taking care of themselves or that nobody would want to sexually pursue someone uh, who is within a black body, especially a fat black, fat black body. Um, and again, this is where intersectionality really uh, takes, uh, becomes really relevant, um, is the way that people understand sexual violence. I know everybody in this space knows that sexual assault is not sex. Uh, rape is not about desirability, but rather power and control. Um, but survivors are often faced with that um, second, so that double standard where um, it is about desirability. And if you are not living up to specific beauty standards, or like the conventional ideal, then you're less likely to be believed because you're not meeting that standard. Um, for whatever reason, some folks seem to forget that rape is about power and control. Um, and I think that's more so to do with marginalized bodies. So now we're gonna talk about how to support black survivors. And it's really just one slide specifically for allies. Uh, particularly white allies. And then I have some resources, but I'm gonna leave some time for questions before I get into the resources. Oops. There you go. So for my white allies, please do your research. Participating in paid workshops, and I mean paid workshops, not the free ones, paid workshops. Uh, like today and reading material written by black indigenous and people of color is one way that you can start. Do not, and I repeat, do not ask any of these folks to educate you without paying for their labor and asking for their capacity. All of this work is incredibly triggering and exhausting, even for those who are trained and do this for a living. We are sharing our pain and lived experiences and deserve to have dedicated space, respectful and attentive participants who are willing to do the work. There are several social media pages that you can follow to diversify your content, who also suggest further reading and viewing materials for your own learning. And I have, those lists also for you of just some people that I have um, and then you can go from there. Actively listen and validate. Listen to hear the experiences of others and validate that they did the best that they could with what they have. If the solution seems simple, you're probably not hearing the whole story. Reflect on your own experiences and how they shaped your internal and external biases and the privileges that you have that may prevent you from relating to the experience being shared. Have I ever had to worry about lack of support from a doctor or fear of violence or dismissal from police? No? Then you lead by their, or 
you follow by their example. Uh, Self-reflect and sit in the discomfort. I think this one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the discomfort could come from feelings of guilt and shame that might relate to either things that were said in the past that maybe you didn't intend for them to be microaggressions, but the impact is still there. Um, there might be shame and guilt around previously held beliefs, and those could be your internal biases as you practice that self-reflection. So sitting in that discomfort and saying, okay, I had this belief, where does it come from? Where did it come from for me? Where did I learn this? How do I unlearn this? And do the practice of unlearning and relearning and decolonizing your own learning. And then finally, challenge, sorry, challenge manifestations of rape culture and all forms of racism. Use your power, privilege, and positionality to actively challenge and disrupt rape culture and racism wherever possible. So this could look like what you said actually isn't funny or what you said was xenophobic, racist, whatever the case may be, whichever ism or phobia it is, and making it clear that it's not tolerated within this space or within this relationship or dynamic, whatever the case may be for you. I want to, oh, nine minutes. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section or in the chat. And I would be more than happy to answer. I will be here for the next nine minutes. Uh, for folks who want to stay connected and continue learning about um, other ways to disrupt rape culture, um, support survivors, you can email me at kelseyablackwomanemotion.org or you can attend our conference, which is coming up within the next two weeks. Um, I will put the link for registration in the chat. Um, <laughs> no problem, I'm just seeing the chat. Um, and then I'm going to share some resources with y'all. If, if my slides would work with me, there you go. So the first few resources are for survivors specifically. And then the bottom three are specifically to expand knowledge specific to sexual violence and um, race-based violence. And then just some social media pages. Yes, this can be emailed. So I've already sent all of this to Maria. Um, so Maria, that's up to you. <laughs> but these are some folks that are within my own network. Um, I having them within my social media just reminds me of and like keeps me updated so much learning just happening on like a passive basis uh, and you can share them with kids family friends whatever the case may be maria welcome back <laughs> thank you so much kelsey <laughs> thank you for, for sharing all that you shared today very powerful information um stirred up a lot of uh, emotions um I, I turned off my video at one point because i was in tears i was like i cannot believe that this, some of this stuff still happening uh in society today but this is a very stark reality and i'm so glad um that you're here today sharing all this information with us um and again thank you um yeah i see your hearts to everyone as well more love coming in for you on the chat there, Kelsey. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will share uh, Kelsey's info with everyone. And I was just posting the uh, conference, so Black Women in Motion conference that's coming up on our social media pages. I just posted the link to get tickets on our Facebook page, and I'll post it to Inst uh, Instagram and Twitter shortly. Um, and if anyone has any questions or any comments for Kelsey, uh, please feel free to post them in the chat. So a few minutes left. Um, such good timing. Exactly. <laughs> I, I usually go over time with my presentations. I'm like, I'm creating this and I'm like, I really got to cut it back. I had so much just to cover just because like this presentation, it really is a crash course into the B pen. Like we covered bystander intervention, media literacy, uh, rape culture 101. Um, and those are like some of our main programs, but also like there's so much more to dive into. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I hope I did it justice. I hope that there was things that folks uh, could take away, like concrete uh, steps, examples, resources that people can use 
and find solidarity with or to relate to something that helps either themselves or someone that they know and love. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, Kelsey, again, on behalf of the Gatehouse, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Um, beautiful. Yes, most definitely. A lot of practical and really great information uh, shared here today. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, and, you know, I love the Gatehouse and all of the amazing work that you do, so I'm always here for you. Thank you. On that note, yeah, everyone's saying thank you to you in the chat. Beautiful. Uh, on that note, we're going to conclude today and uh, definitely check out Black Women in Motion. Um, their Instagram is right there on the screen. Follow them online and share all their links, uh, especially the upcoming conference they have happening uh, in a week or so. All right. Thank you again, Kelsey, on behalf of the Gatehouse. Thank you, everyone, for attending today and keep sharing all this information. Have a safe and wonderful rest of your afternoon. And the next workshop for our conference is yoga at five o'clock. I'm looking forward to that, too. <laughs> Yahoo, 20 minutes of yoga. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe and wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Kelsey. Bye.